Are you seeking... Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a superhero group for Masks, A New Generation. This episode we'll be discussing the character creation process. Let's welcome back Brandon, James, and Elsbeth, all from Protean City Comics, a Masks actual play podcast. Could you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell everyone a little bit about the character you made in our last episode? Um, Elsbeth, we will start off with you this time. Okay, cool. Hi guys, my name is Elspeth. I'm a member of the Porting City Podcast. Um, I made a character called Cordelia Snort. It's an unfortunate name that she was given at birth. Um, her hero name is The Idealist, and she, I'm playing the Delinquent Playbook. Um, her powers are power negation and emotional control. And uh, she's sort of a grungy, tomboyish um, 14-year-old. All right, and James? I made a transformed named Tommy Treadwell, who goes by Whip as a uh, when he's being a hero. And he is a, uh, well, he used to be Asian, and uh, now he's mostly car. Um, he was transformed during a terrible uh, auto shop accident, uh, and he has cherry red skin, uh, headlights for eyes, and... Um, he just wants to uh, get out there and help people, um, and 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 hope that he can find people who won't, who can see past his uh, his outer paint, his windshield wipers, his windshield wipers, yeah, um, <laughs> and help him see in fog because he can't see in fog very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and what about you, Brandon? Hey, uh, I made a Janus. Uh, my character's name is Iggy Reyes or La Calavera which is uh like the those sugar skull candies uh, technically it's like the skull but it's it's got a little bit of that feel to it and is kind of decorated in those very bright colors um uh she has the power of uh bone generation and impossible mobility and uh what she does is kind of has bones that sprout from her when she's in her costume look um, you may have noticed that I switched pronouns from the beginning of talking about Iggy, because outside of costume, Iggy is male and uses male pronouns, and in costume, uh, she is female and uses female pronouns, which is part of just more of the sort of double life. And uh, as the Janus, she is not... No one knows who she secretly is when she's wearing the mask. And so having that as a additional difference in their in her identity makes her a little bit harder to notice a little bit harder for people to figure out who it is because when the rumors started to spread about who she might be and so people started using female pronouns with her it was like okay yeah we can go with that and then lots of self-discovery to come from there uh she also uh, iggy rather because now this is part of the mundane life uh is also an intern at a horrible technological experimentation location uh, that I'm blanking on the name of right now. Uh, Callaway Corp. Callaway Corp. Callaway that's what Corp. it was. Um, and additionally, has a grandmother at home that he has to take care of a lot, and a significant other that we haven't really delved into at all, and probably won't right now. <laughs> so that's Iggy. All right. Um, and Ryan. Uh, yeah, for my character, I created a, an outsider uh, named Mishra. She is from a planet called Felinar Prime. And uh, she is part of a, an alien race that uh, is naturally stunningly beautiful and has a natural combat ability, which is a, a custom ability that we made uh, for this character. Uh, and what that does is basically she is able to use any weapons proficiently. Uh, even if she's never seen it before. And she's able to look at people's combat abilities while in combat with them and then mimic them and figure out ways to counter their attacks uh, easily after observing them for a bit. 
Um, she crashed, landed on Earth as a child, probably about 12 years old, and she's been here for about four years. Uh, about three of those, she's been on her own trying to make it on the streets, and then she ran into these four and uh, has been working with them ever since um, and finally feels like she's part of a family. So uh, she's actually decided to want to stay here in case her race ever uh, finds her hiding out on this uh, this backwater planet called Earth. <laughs> All right. And then I made Beatrice. Um, I did pick a last name since we last talked. Um, her last name is now McAllister. Um, and I used the Doomed playbook. And so... Um, she has a nemesis named William Calloway IV. He is the owner um, of Calloway Corp, which is a big energy conglomerate. Um, her abilities are memory manipulation and psychic constructs. She really does not like to use memory manipulation because she feels like it's kind of creepy and skeevy. Her powers sort of manifest as... Um, Particularly with the with the constructs, um, everything looks kind of like flames. Um, she is redheaded and uh, kind of on the shorter side, a little bit curvy, um, and constantly wearing a lab coat. She spends most of her time in her sanctuary, which is an old abandoned school building, um, where she does all sorts of research and experiments, kind of trying to find a way to slow down the power that she has that is uh, sort of eating her alive, like burning her alive from the inside, which is why William Calloway is her nemesis. Um, she is currently an endless source of energy and uh, being the manager of an energy conglomerate, that's kind of what you're looking for. It's also a really good internship. Uh, it's going to look great <laughs> on college, uh, college applications. I'm very excited. Yeah, I mean, Harvard can't say no to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably something a little closer to Brodian City. Uh, oh, actually, wait. Brodian you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty close. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? And in this segment, we will be covering our thoughts on the character creation process, how it feels compared to other systems and, and other various questions that we've got. All right, cool. So we're going to start by discussing sort of in a more system neutral sense what your personal processes are for making characters in any role playing system. When any of you guys sit down to make a character for a game, what kind of things do you like to do first? What kind of things do you think about? Um, what parts are you really passionate about? This is a funny one for me because I am almost always the GM in my games. Uh, our group has a couple of other people that also like to GM, but in, in no way a problematic way, I frequently am the one who is running things, uh, which I love to do. I love running games. And so when I do actually make a character, lots of times I have ideas in mind that have been bouncing around in my head, and I write non-player characters often enough that it's relatively easy for me to essentially sit down at a table ready to make a character. Where I think that is maybe a little bit different from coming in with more of a player mindset is that I almost never have any real backstory or plans for the character ahead of time because I kind of am used to creating NPCs that could... Uh, die in the first scene and that would be really fine in terms of their narrative and so making similar sorts of characters that who knows where they they lead i've got no plans for them and what happens happens uh ends up being sort of my go-to uh i'm very much interested in playing out new things that haven't appeared in recent games also so I'll like if I, when I was looking at the abilities for the Janus because I was relatively sure I wanted to make one. I knew we'd seen rodent control. I knew we'd seen supernatural senses. We'd seen a little bit of energy absorption, uh, substance mimicry. We hadn't really seen, but bone generation was definitely new. So I grabbed that just to kind of continue fleshing things out in terms of what <laughs> fleshing things out in terms of what can be in the world. 
So do you tend to look at it then from a GM standpoint? Do you put in your own kind of story hooks or do you just leave it totally open? Oh, the more story hooks I can give, the better. Like you may notice that when I was choosing the things for my secret identity, I went with an internship at a place that we know is run by an evil NPC. (laughs) I went with a uh, person at home who could be potentially in danger. And I went with a significant other that probably wouldn't want me running around the city as a completely different person and probably wouldn't understand me running around the city as a completely different person. And those are very, like, those are very serious hooks that I'm saying, hey, do these things. These are things that you can pull on. The the fact that Calavera and the, that Iggy slash Calavera has to kind of eventually start thinking about what their identity really means, what it is to be both Iggy and Calavera and feel very much right in right in their skin in both is another thing that it's just saying to the gm hey push on this pull on this this is story to explore nice and how about uh james or elizabeth i can come at i can actually i think the way that i create characters is very interestingly similar and very different from the way brandon does which is that i i don't gm a whole lot but i do obviously spend a lot of times thinking about it and um, and so one of the things that I do when I sit down to make any character in any system is I think about what their belief structure is, because the thing that is most important to me is to make characters who take actions. Yeah. A lot of my early gaming was with a group that was just like paralyzed by indecision And so at some point I made a decision that all of my characters were going to have a very clear belief structure and that they were going to follow that belief structure just to the T and that if that meant doing something that wasn't um, party optimal or uh, really like (laughs) self-serving, that that was going to be okay. That if my character is pissed off by people making fun of them, then my character is going to react poorly to that. Or is my character uh, bold and brave to the point of um, probably being stupid? Well, then my paladin's going to burst through the door. Uh, He's going to check to see what's behind a door by bursting through it or kicking it down. (laughs) <laughs> and and so anytime I start to think about making a new character, I start to think, what is this world that we're building a character in? Um, what are the, ty- the types of things that are the characters supposed to be considering? And then I build out a belief structure from there, um, saying my character wants to do this, my character wants to do that, my character will never do this, and then building out the rest of the character from there. That's an interestingly active way to do it, as opposed to saying, yeah. who are you, rather than saying, what no, do you do? because I always want to make you... the character who takes those actions, and I'll figure out who the character is that takes those actions later. Interesting. Yeah. That, that, I think, also is kind of interestingly also a GME sort of approach. I think, James, I know, James, you, you did some GMing in college and stuff like that. And I think that there is a tendency among GMs to go, okay, how do I play a character that pushes the story along? Yeah. Because if you've done any amount of GMing for people that, like, you know, have not spent time GMing, there will be the three hour long session <laughs> where nothing happens. And there was a time in my life that I was totally cool with the three hour long session where nothing happens, but now it makes me cry. And yeah. so I think <laughs> now you're you an adult have... with other things to do and <laughs> yeah, a like, limited and amount of time. Yeah. So if you've got GMs at the table making characters, they will almost always make characters that move the plot forward. Uh, James, uh, James and I just did a recording for an upcoming Protean City. I think it's going to be the end of March issue that was the two of us and another uh, another just consummate professional incredible gm that uh we moved along things so ridiculously freaking (laughs) fast because all of us were just immediately thinking and what's the next thing and what's the next thing and just kept it so punchy and james's characters always consistently are so (laughs) punchy (laughs) yeah punchy to the point of some some destruction sometimes 
Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. A lot of times, <laughs> one of the first things I did, when I say like, what are the beliefs? What are the actions my character are going to take? Is I think, what is the dumb thing my character is going to do? Right. The suboptimal decision. Work, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is the least optimal group decision that I can make? What is the decision that I can make as a character? What is the thing that my character will believe that will suck us into a story <laughs> that we should that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten into? Right. Not the. And I would like to spend the next hour and a half making Taking this, this plan. safe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's an also an interesting way of looking at it, though. I think people who do actual play podcasts tend to think that way, too, more than people that are sitting down and playing at a table, because there's mm, this constant true. need to keep things moving forward and have it be interesting rather than optimal. Um, and, you know, sometimes when you're sitting and playing at a table, you, you really want your character to live for a really long time and you want to be <laughs> able to finish out this campaign. And, you know, so sometimes you don't always make the most interesting decision, but you make the best decision. Whereas when you're playing for other people, there's a sort of need to to keep everyone interested and say, you know what, this is like not a good choice. And I know that, but it's what my character would do. And it makes the story interesting. So we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> That's the other thing that where Brandon makes characters where he doesn't like flesh them out too much immediately because he's thinking about them like NPCs where kind of maybe like if they if we discover their backstory, we discover it. But if they die in the first scene, uh, that's fine. Like he's sort of death ambiguous. I'm mm -hmm. actively trying to create characters <laughs> that will die. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna love them first so we're gonna be oh, really yeah, yeah. upset when you kill them off yeah. yeah yeah no that death needs to be meaningful but it needs to happen <laughs> to give an idea of how ridiculously death ambivalent i am uh elsbeth is soon going to be running a session that introduces my player character Ooh. and i'm very i'm so excited i love my player character i'm very invested in him and uh, it recently occurred to me that there's a possibility that I don't make it through the volume. Oh, wow. And I'm okay with that. There are, like, two or three different... Because I know, like, a couple of kind of core ideas that I needed to go in knowing. And there's a real decent chance of him not being able to join the team. Or him not being able to go through things in the way that we think that it might go. And that is okay. And if that happens, then I'll make a different character. <laughs> because my characters are NPCs. It's okay, I'll, I'll protect you. I'll be sad, because I'll, I'll feel terrible, but it's definitely possible. <laughs> no, there would be no need to feel no, I just terrible, will because, because I'm, be attached, more I'm attached story. to him also. Oh, uh, well, you don't I'll have to be. be sad. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if anyone's going to die on this podcast... It's going to be Puck. It's going to be oh me. Oh my god. If I manage to kill my player character before James does, I will James be James is going to be so, so mad. He's going to be so mad. Oh my god. I'll never forgive you. If, <laughs> if I hit a certain amount of six minuses, I'm just going to take a piece of paper out, fold it in half, and hand it to Elsbeth. And it's just going to say, <laughs> Kill me. Killing a, killing a player character is a perfectly acceptable hard <laughs> move in masks. <laughs> awesome. What about you, Elsbeth? What do you kind of think about when you're making a character? I don't know if there's a way to be opposite of both, but the way James is speaking about going um, inside out, I kind of go the other way. And I'm also relatively new to the tabletop RPG um, community, so I haven't played that many varying different types of games. Most of the games I've played have been PBTA because of Brandon and then what, James. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is all Brandon's fault. I introduced him to theater and he introduced me to this. Um, you but didn't because introduce me to theater exactly. I've been doing I, some theater. You dragged me. I dragged you to college theater. <laughs> I said, Brandon, come do this with me. You make great voices. Um, <laughs> it worked. So, uh, yeah. So when I make characters, my background is, is in acting. So I kind of start with one primary feature, whether that be in masks, it's their power set or like a family background or maybe maybe something traumatic that happened in their life or whatever, start with one prominent feature and then work my way in. So how would that affect the way that you grow and develop? What would your defense mechanisms be? How would you speak to people? Um, what might your thoughts on the world be had this, considering this one factor? So I'll get fascinated by one little piece and then let that grow into the whole thing. Um, it could be a style. It could be what they study in school. It really kind of depends on my mood at the moment. Um, but that one little feature will grow the whole character for me. Nice. Well, that kind of leads into the next question is how, how do we think masks stands up to uh, other systems that uh, you guys have played? I know it's fairly similar to uh, PBTA in terms of 
the very basic core play style. But what about other things? So the thing that I think that it does really well and that I can go off on for a long time, if you let me, is that yeah. because Masks is invested in the idea that you are a you're a group of superheroes, it gives you a lot of op- it, it, broadly this is a thing that that like PBTA games do in general, but it's a thing that Masks does particularly well, which is giving you these sort of open-ended hooks that build out sort of emergent story. Um, and, and it focuses a lot of them towards how you have interacted with the other characters in the group in the past. And so like, it's everything from, it straight up asks like, what was the first time that you all came together and gives everyone a question where you each get to build part of that story out. And so it kind of like, in a perfect world in every system, you would, you would go through and talk about your character. And while you're doing that character introduction, you would uh, you would introduce each other and you would find the little pieces of narrative where your characters hook in together. Um, but Mask sort of gives you that framework to do that by getting you starting to talk about how your characters came together. And every time I've made characters in Masks, we've gone through those questions, but all of our answers have always expanded past those initial questions. And and everything, like the, the greatest moment, like the best example of this was when Amelia, you were setting up your nemesis, and Brandon was like, oh, I need to fill out this thing that says where I have, an, like, a job. It makes perfect sense that my character would be interning at your nemesis's giant corporation, and that is a cool piece of, like, you would maybe never have thought of that, except that it sort of gave you these these uh, these uh starter questions that help you find narrative, and they're yeah. open-ended enough and broad enough that it just makes sense to sort of start connecting them. There's also a lot of them in those connections. If you look at, I mean, I think possibly the best question in every single backstory playbook in this is, why do you care about the team? Because one of the worst things that happens in, uh, like, troop or party-based role-playing games is, I'm the ranger, and I sit in the corner of the tavern, and I don't have any Mm -hmm. friends or anything, I don't care about you all, I'll murder all of you if I get the chance. And then immediately followed by, and I'm the rogue, and what I'll do. Like, and then that's just the entire thing of everybody just wanting to sit in the corner and only along because it's, like, you know, a little bit of gold. And that can be fun if you're playing uh, Swords Without Master. But if you're superheroes, that's crappy. Like, a team of Batmans would never exist. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, to be fair, I have played a game where we were all in a room together and we were supposed to be working together and we played for, I think, like three hours and our characters never interacted with each other. Oh, <laughs> like we all interacted with the story and the yeah. surroundings. And I mean, we had plenty of fun, but yeah. that's not an ideal game and certainly not why you sit at, sit around a table with your friends. Well, it's especially not an ideal game if you are doing a party-based thing. Because Masks is party-based. Mm-hmm. A lot of PBTA games are not and kind of aim players against each other. But this one is explicitly saying, hey, you're a team. You care about the team. You're not going to leave the team for just no reason. Let's codify that. So yeah. why do you care about the team? When our team came together, that's two. Two different relationships, that's three and four, and influence, which gives at least one connection. You've got five things on your character sheet that say, hey, this team is important, connect with them. Oh my god, please connect with them. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the things that actually I think is important and is largely overlooked um, in in the way that it builds that sort of interconnected narrative is the fact that even something as simple as the abilities you choose from are incredibly, they're, they're evocative and they're interesting, but they are incredibly vague in a way that if you all Definitely. wanted to say, we have a shared, like, Fantastic Four, we were all in a, in a space station and a wave of energy hit us, so all of our powers come from the same source, they're vague enough that you could describe all your powers as being, like, you joined in some way. I'm going to even show a little more of the secret behind this. Uh, Calavera has the ability to grow bones, like, you know, like, have the bones stick out and everything. The Doomed has body transmutation, which can include growing bones. The Mm -hmm. Outsider has, uh, where is it? Uh, Radical Mm shape-shifting, you know, like growing bones. (laughs) The The Transformed transformed. has impenetrable armor. Yeah, or transmuting flesh. You know, yeah, yeah. 
like growing bones. <laughs> uh, uh, Elizabeth, I'm trying to find the delinquent. Where is it in the play? But here it is. The delinquent has... Oh, okay. Oh, psychic weapons. You know, like bones growing out of you, psychically. Like, <laughs> the thing is, you can do pretty much anything with these abilities, and you can build them out in any way you would like to. You can be a fully themed team that all has the same power, but each of those has enough of a di different flavor that they would still feel different. The delinquent mm -hmm. is probably firing the bones out at people. The doomed is probably doing weird magical stuff. And so, like, all of those things could be the same thing, and you could be the skeleton <laughs> squad, but you would still be really individualized, really interesting characters that have different story arcs because of their playbooks. Gosh, Brandon. The the Nova has biokinesis, like moving bones with your mind. Yeah. <laughs> the, to be fair, the Nova can do whatever. The beacon has phasing, you know, like phasing your bones out of your body. <laughs> it is literally every, every playbook. And you can do that with any power. The bone one is maybe an easy one. But you can do that with any power you want. All of them can be made. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked a little bit about how like broad and vague things are. Um, and I finally, between last week and this week, got a chance to listen to a couple of the um, Session Zero episodes for Protean City. And it is super interesting, James, that we did go through and pick almost exactly <laughs> the same things. And, you know, Beatrice and Puck look nothing alike. Like, they're yeah. two yeah. completely different characters. And so every time you would go through and you're like, oh, I picked this and this. I was like, I did too, but it doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> nope. Like, they're not even close. Because they're story hooks. They're there to get you to start creating fiction. Yeah, and it's just fascinating to me. Did you notice that Calavera made the same choices as Spider-Man? <laughs> Slightly, I did. Uh, but it doesn't look at all the same. It's a very different character. Web generation is underneath bone generation. Yeah. As if anyone would choose anything other than bone generation. Come on. Also, just in terms of creating the characters and what makes it a really interesting thing within masks specifically is that it does an enormous amount of goalposting for what you're supposed to be doing. Um, superheroes are, by their very nature, a reactive genre. It's a little bit tough to say, like, okay, your superhero is fighting supervillains, you're gonna go to set up a plot that you've come up with. No, you've, you kind of have to wait for the bad guy to do something um, before you can do that. And so having playbooks that really emphasize what your long-term character arc can be through its team moves, through its moment of truth, through some of the moves that show you when you mark potential and things like that, all of that helps to really create a satisfying superhero that stands on their own and does stuff and isn't just, oh, I'm punches guy when things go bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not that he's also not a valuable member of yeah, the team. Yeah, I want to play that person. What are you talking about? Uh, I think that would be the bull. <laughs> <laughs> I've played no, that. punches <laughs> things when things go well. <laughs> oh, that's true. Just punches things all the time, guy. Punch things yeah, yeah. all times. The bull, by the way, uh, this actually kind of ties into the same thing. The uh, moves have the most enchantingly wonderful names. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for example, the best named move in the entire game punch everyone <laughs> which is a bull move and it, it does exactly what what it sounds like that's awesome i like in a china shop in a china shop is good yeah, the bull a as a one. whole is a really well put together list of names for the moves so i want to we started talking about it a little bit um but i want to kind of deep dive a little bit more and talk about how the mechanics of character creation lead to the the feel of the game um, what kind of things do you do in character creation that sort of give the player an idea of what playing a game of masks is going to feel like? Well, definitely when you start, one of the, I know Brandon is a huge fan of this, and, and he's totally, totally right. In the beginning, when you are making your character, one of the first things you're going to see is what your basically your ethnicity is or your skin color or um, what your appearance is. And that immediately calls attention to the fact that, hey, you can be something other than maybe what you are or what you've normally seen in media, which is great. And then that's reinforced by the art on each of the playbooks, which are just mm -hmm. incredible. And for me, when I first was shown these playbooks, I'm like, they are the opposite. The character on the sheet is almost exactly the opposite of what I expected to see. 
and it makes me so happy each time. And like, uh, we just saw the new newer playbooks come out. Yes, I was going to talk and, about. You. Oh God, they're so good. And and is it the brain, Brandon? Yeah, the brain yeah. is a hijabi. She's yeah, she's wearing a hijab, it's and incredible. I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is the representation that we've been craving for so long. But what it does is introduce you to this world of masks, saying everyone is here. Everyone is here. Everyone can be a hero. There is no stereotype that um, you know you need to stick within, or you know, it's it's no boundaries. You're entering a world that's inclusive, and um, that feels incredible. So I think that's one of the the best introductions into the world that the character creation does well and that's a, th- a thing that i loved about it right away cause, and we talked about it a little bit last time too that um it's nice to just have because it lays out a couple choices and you certainly don't have to pick those choices but it's nice to have those in front of you as that sort of reminder instead of that blank box that says race or you know look even um it's nice to have a few choices so you can say oh i don't have to be what i am um, I, I can pick from one of these other things and kind of broaden the scope of what I'm looking at here. And I think it's also an important reminder that, you know, you're you're playing in a world where people can be cars. Um, so there's no reason why you also have to be white if you can be a car. And if you're a car, you still don't have to be white. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can be a red car even. I think that the transformed is is a Latino character, if I'm not mistaken. I vaguely remember that there, because all of the pictures are also these like kind of uh, iconic characters that you can get some information on somewhere. I don't remember off the top of my head where, um, but like just even in that they didn't go with the default assumption that most uh, most media seems to go with, and so like that's just that's really cool. I think the thing in character creation that most to me feels like like shows you what the game is gonna feel like is when you hit that when our fir- team first came together. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. honestly, when our team first came together is a mini RPG. I have played less sophisticated micro RPGs. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and the questions just really lead you through where, what about your character is going to be having a big effect in-game. Um, they're really carefully chosen. They, pay, they make a lot of sense. And... Essentially, the when our team first came together question is a question that the GM could ask you all the freaking time. Um, like, the Janus having, we saved the life of someone important. Uh, the Janus is about saving people that are important to you. Because it's about <laughs> people being important to you. And it's, it's the same for all of them. The, uh, the doomed paying a high cost. The delinquent uh, breaking rules. Uh, trans- I'm trying to remember what the transformed is. Oh, being hated and feared. <laughs> like, it's, it's the questions the GM should be asking every single time you're in, our, in a fight. And it's really nice because it, it really sets up an expectation of player agency throughout the game. Yeah. Which I, I'm just re- really a big fan of before getting into the PBTA scene. You know, most of the, the 80s and 90s role-playing games, they're, they're all GM is everything and you are just yourself and that's the only control that you have. Whereas nowadays, in, in, with games like Masks and whatnot, it's basically forcing the players to say, you know, you have some control over what's happening in this world. Which also makes you more responsible for... Um doing your own research, coming up with your own inventive ways to play the game, maybe coming to the table with something you'd like to explore about your character because you might get that opportunity. Um, whereas in other games, you you might not because you're kind of at the mercy of what's planned for you. I think it keeps you engaged too as a player though because having that agency is is makes it a lot easier to sit down and say, okay, I care about what's happening because I got to make all of these choices about who I am and how we connect and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. The big thing for me that I'm going to go off in a little bit of a different direction um, about the character creation is that I think that speaks to how, 
how the mechanics of character creation inform the gameplay is when you sit down and you start, there is like a paragraph on the first page. It's very small, usually a couple sentences that's like, yes. what are your powers? Uh, yeah, you're going to shoot some some spider web and you're going to fly and you're probably whatever. You're going to do superhero stuff like that's a given. Uh, and then the whole second page is like, buddy, how do you keep a job and to do this too? Like if you're looking at the Janus or like, how do you, what do you do when you lie about your job? Like, how does that make you feel? Or like, if you're the <laughs> beacon, you've got like a, you, you're looking at these moves and like, you're okay. You, you got some swords or whatever. Like that's, that's whatever. Like you're, you, we're, that's a given, like you're a hero. Like, what do you do? How do you feel when you tell someone and they recognize your superhero name? Like the, the, the moves page being this huge, like chunk of the character sheet that is not about like, how do you superhero, but how does your character interact with the world around them? How do like, what are they, what are the choices they make? What are the things they're driven by? Um, that's not about the hero. It's about the, the, the kid. I think the best example of that, James, is looking at the bull. Um, because people who choose the, like the bull is the, Hey, I want to hit things. And, like, it is custom-made for the person who wants to play your superhero game with you and doesn't want to think about any of this emotional stuff, if you're looking at the first page of it. <laughs> yeah. Which is a why trap. a bunch of people... It's a trap. It's 100% a trap. Because and then it's, it's probably one of the most emotional playbooks Absolutely. that there are. And, <laughs> like, it has a feature that is hugely emotional. Out of the six moves that it has, only one of them doesn't directly relate to emotions and you have to choose two it's genius <laughs> it is it's genius looking at the playbooks and like the way they're laid out it's like the the front part with the look and the abilities it's like going into a therapist's office and it's like this is the form that you fill out when you first sit down yeah. and then you go into the office like now we're going to start and we're going to talk <laughs> about everything that we didn't have time to fill in in all of those boxes like you've checked yeah. your couple things and you're like not even close to done we are just getting started with the emotional trauma and I, and I think that 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 also goes back to the pbta style of gameplay where like like you're gonna do superhero stuff if oh, yeah. you are directly engaging a threat and you fail, you still do superhero stuff. You still mm -hmm. directly engage that threat. Like, that action that you described still happens. It's just that the fallout isn't quite as good as you hoped it would be. <laughs> yeah, it, it can be great to have someone roll a six minus and then describe in amazing detail how cool it looks while they fight. Yeah. Or if you're Kalino, you just choose to pass out because it's easier than... <laughs> <laughs> getting knocked out three more times next time he does it i'm flinging him off a building I know, right? <laughs> there's very few ways for you to like fail at the action and so and that's very superhero -y. like you you don't want to play a superhero game where like spider-man is is swinging around and like is just trying to get to the action and goes to shoot some web and it and like rolls a six minus and then falls to the ground and there's no there's no bad guys around and they die <laughs> The Batman game where the difficulty class to figure out the clue to find the Joker was 15 and you rolled a 12, and then yeah. you don't get to find the Joker. Yeah. And then the <laughs> game is like, <laughs> Just give up, go home. That's not superhero-y, and that's not PBTA, and the, the interesting thing is, what do you do once you get there? Like, you're gonna do all that other stuff. Yeah. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Also, a wonderful thing for people to look at at some point that we didn't touch is the core GM reference, which is a free PDF oh that's also on the masks thing. It is, it is just like I was I was gonna try to look at it and pull a couple of cool things out of it, but it's just so perfect that it's hard to even do that. Uh, like the Janus, it suggests moves to make against the players for if they fail, and like the Janus has take away their mask. Cool. That's incredible the delinquent has put them in chains which is very cool but it also has uh give them conditional love oh no yeah oh and offer a helping hand it's like hey they rolled a six minus make someone come in and help them because that's gonna hurt them so much more than <laughs> having them punched in the face that's gonna be so much more powerful because they'll know they didn't deserve it and that's where this game sings yeah and and from a gming 
point of view, because I did, I have GM'd a couple games of Masks, it's so cool to be able to go through and say, okay, well, I've got this character and this character and this character, and here are the four actions for each of those those playbooks that the game suggests I make. So now yeah. here's a big list of things I need to do in the session that is going to like be the punchiest, emotionally like disturbing things that I can do to these characters that will like hit them in the places where they have connected with their characters. Hey, James, uh, things are going well. You're feeling really good. I'm going to attack you with unthinking hordes because you're the transformed and you yeah. can just destroy them. It's an opportunity for you to show off how cool you are. And then for me to say, hey, are those unthinking hordes really any different from the monster that you are? Oh. <laughs> and or the thing the that I did in mm. the session uh, that I GM'd of Protean City where I threw a whole bunch of just like normal humans at, yeah. uh, at penance who can like throw magic and i was like well this person can't deal with having magic thrown at them so if you're gonna shoot fire at them they're gonna light on fire and like that's gonna hurt and that's gonna be disturbing to you because it was like one of the things they suggest to sh is to show the the nova how their powers mm -hmm. can affect and and break the world yeah it really did um it did it messed with me i'll <laughs> be straight it was it was rough no spoilers <laughs> oh right right <laughs> And now I'm over here, you know, I'm planning this, um, this new session for, for introducing Brandon's playing character, play character. And I, I'm trying to think of all of these kinds of things. So this is super educational for me. <laughs> this is super helpful. You have to go back and listen to all of the horrible things that he's done to you and then make notes so you can get right? back at him. Mm -hmm. Except that apparently he doesn't care. Right. I, it's very rare that I get to play the, a game with Brandon where he's the character. So I'm like, I'm used to James's shenanigans. I'm not as <laughs> ready for Brandon's. One of, <laughs> one of the principles in this game is sometimes disclaim decision making, which means sometimes turn to the table and say, hey, what's the worst thing that could happen here? And another part of that is sometimes letting the other players set up the most negative things. And that's actually what I've primarily done with Elsbeth. <laughs> Yeah, I dig my own grave frequently. <laughs> Instead of making direct moves against her, I just kind of like turn to someone else and go like, hey, how'd that make you feel? And I'm over here like, Brandon, you know just how to hurt me. And really, <laughs> like the thing that is great about that is that all of those things, what they're doing is they are like, not to like, Brandon, you were talking, I forget what you called it earlier. Um... But the, the thing that is great about have, having uh, the way that the game thinks about what you should be doing as a player and thinks about how it's engaged in you as, as a team and the way that, um, of course, you're going to do superhero things, so let's move on to the other interesting stuff, yeah. is that that's all very, like, that's what the genre is. And so it's, it's just sort of baked that genre into the core mechanics of the game, which helps you, if you have never watched Young Justice or the Justice League or or whatever you've never watched like a teen superhero show you can sit down and this game will be like a giant pointing arrow that says play this way and you will do well and you will have fun and this is the genre here it is go this way and there isn't a whole lot that isn't sort of baked it isn't the genre and so you will accidentally play that way and yeah. you will accidentally build a story that hits that genre perfectly yeah and you can really see that if you start to play multiple games of masks because the playbooks contain so much of that drama that, like, if you play a game that is the, the Janus, the Legacy, and the Beacon, it's going to be bright and happy and pretty good. If you're playing a game that is the Doomed, the Transformed, and the Delinquent, uh, it's going to be really sad. And that isn't based on anything but the playbook driving you in the exact direction you need to be going. Yeah, because the playbook's basically set up how the story is going to feel, which is really yeah. interesting. Which I was really, this is the first time that I've sat down to do anything with PBTA. Um, and so the idea of playbooks was a little bit weird to me um, because I, I'm, my process for creating characters is usually to start with um, like who I want them to be as a person and then figure out what mechanics reinforce that and so sitting down to do it with a playbook felt really out, sort of out of character for me and I wasn't sure how that was going to work out and I was very very surprised at just how broad everything is and how much 
like detail and personal input I could still have, even though so much of it is outlined already. Yeah, it seems like the the reason why it's so general is to get you to fill in those blanks so you are even that much more emotionally invested in your character. You're not just invested in who they are as a person and whatnot. You're invested in how their abilities look, how how everything about them comes to be within the game, uh, including the relationships with everybody else that's in your party. Exactly. Which I think kind of brings us to our next question a little bit too, which is to talk about how the the process of m- making a character in this system either adds or detracts from immersion in the in the world. I think that maybe the thing that it most does is it gives you some ideas of the boundaries of the world. So like, let's say that all of the players sit down and you make uh, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, uh, and Daredevil, uh, and then someone else comes along and makes a very bad character, um, then you know, okay, we're looking at a world that there are people that have some above human abilities, but it's relatively light fare. If you come to the table and someone says, hey, uh, I'm the Janus, that means my powers don't, didn't change me all that much, I can turn into liquid metal and fly through the internet, (laughs) then you've established a very different world, you know? And, like, they can exist within the same world. Like, we've got the the Defenders and the Avengers and the the Great Lakes Avengers, and those are all very different things. But, and the X-Men, maybe, you know, my favorite (laughs) series. Uh, But you can create, you by creating your characters, you goalpost for the GM what kind of a world you want to see. If everybody makes a martial artist, then I should be looking at my uh, my mind-controlling, dreamscape, poison-drinking dude and saying, hey, uh, this might be from a different comic run than the one we're writing right now. <laughs> it's like inserting Deadpool into pretty much anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> except, for the, except for the Great Lakes Avengers, actually. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would kind of say that Masks does have its own setting, like you have Halcyon City. Yeah. But really, in sitting down and creating these characters, um, we didn't have to worry so much about immersion because we were kind of making the world as we made the characters. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, almost like a backwards <laughs> yeah. way of doing it. Um, just to, to like to bounce off of what Brandon was saying, like one of the biggest uh, immersion breaking things for me in character creation usually is uh, I can't tell you the number of characters I've made in in like old like the old Serenity system or in D and D where we all sat down to make characters and we came back and I had made a character that was absolutely supposed to be in a different story. Um, <laughs> yeah, the game <laughs> mechanic, and and so there's there's kind of that like first contact. Like, when do you first contact other characters? And for a lot of games of D&D, it's very plausible that everyone will make their characters in a vacuum. And so the first time that you as a player have contact with the other player's characters is when you all sit down at the end to, like, talk about your characters. But the way that Masks works is it gets you past a lot of the sort of, like, just, like, fill-in-the-blanks type stuff early and gets you straight away to that first contact where you're interacting with each other's stories and narrative and and characters and stuff like that. And so it does a lot to prevent... Like, if you sit down and make start making a Masks character and you're the player who's making that character that's, like, wildly powerful in a low-level, like, sort of Defenders-style uh, story, like, you're going to find out really early that that's the case and you're either going to pull it back or you're going to have to think about why narratively is my character that is so much more powerful hanging out with these characters because yeah. you're building that narrative together so much earlier in the character creation process. Yeah, and I, I think the really when I'm looking at it, the only part about the actual character creation uh, that could even remotely detract from immersion is figuring out where you want to put that plus one to your... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like the only mechanical... Yeah, it's, it. I mean, you could look thing. at it completely from a mechanical standpoint. Okay, what moves did I choose and what will benefit me the most that way? Um, you could do that completely robotic. But when you th- think about the labels and what each label means to your characters, which I know James is a big fan of, <laughs> you you basically 
are still in a full level of immersion figuring out where you want that plus one because if you think well this character they have a minus one in danger and i think they're actually a lot more dangerous than that and they feel themselves as dangerous maybe i'm going to put my plus one there even if it doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. to the rest of my moves it can also connect to the um the relationships that you're building because as you're building relationships you're telling little vignettes of pieces of your life and you're hearing um pieces of your the other players lives and there could be something in there that uh connects you strongly to somebody else and maybe you were feeling really superior but now you're feeling more mundane and you know it can be affected by even just that little mini role play in the beginning that is so crucial to the the character creation so i don't even think that that um, one stat change can pull you, it could pull you out if if done that way, but it can easily be so, so interwoven into the story. Mm -hmm. I usually recommend doing that plus one at the end, because if everything else in the, in the uh, character creation is pointing you toward like, like I'm looking at the transformed playbook right now. And like the, the transformed starts with a negative one and in superior and mundane and a plus three in freak. And so everything about that playbook is pushing you towards creating a character that sees themselves as very strange, very weird, not very cool, like not very good, uh, not, not, not better than other people and, and not even very normal. And and so you will own, like nine times out of ten you will hit that that set of labels perfectly during character creation and the plus one just sort of says where did I through the narrative creation of this character kind of like miss just a little bit mm-hmm. and how can I reconcile that and in mine I said like my character kind of wants to use the fact that they are a little bit freaky to draw fire and save other people so like I'm gonna kick my savior up to one from zero. Uh, because yeah. that's just sort of the specific character that I made. Mm-hmm. It also really gives an opportunity for the GM to say, hey, in session one, what am I going to push? Because uh, if they gave themselves a plus one, you can either say, oh, you think you're dangerous? Well, let's see how dangerous you can be. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or you go, oh, you think you're dangerous? What about when you enter the big leagues? And so the one that people added the plus one to is like the little flag that they put in saying, hey, I'm interested in having a conversation about whether this is me or not. That's very interesting. Well, and I, I think that the way that you build a character in this system too, because it's you have all these little sections in your playbook, um, but there's not really any indication necessarily of which one you have to do first. So really, it can be kind of as immersive or non-immersive as you want because you can decide which parts you fill out first. So you can do things right away, like, you know, if you wanted to put your plus one somewhere right away, you could get that out of the way and then kind of dive in, or you can choose to do that last, like you guys described, to say, you know, here's a, here's a thing that sort of reinforces all the other choices that I've made. Mm-hmm. That's also in some ways a little bit of a false choice, because, like, labels move a lot in this game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when done correctly, yeah. When when you uh, I don't know if you've you haven't hit uh, uh, our first volume, but the first thirty seconds of one of mm-hmm. our characters being in the scenes included her labels shifting, and I think if you extend that to two minutes, it included her labels shifting twice. More than yeah, yeah. So it's it's not as integral to who you are as a person overall. Like it's you know it like real humanity kind of depends on your mood and what you're doing at that moment and it's a way of tracking growth it's a way of tracking like how you're feeling how the world is affecting you how you're affecting the world and and others in it and what things are going to stick on you what labels are going to stay kind of the same and which ones are going to fluctuate a ton because you're the most affected by them well and it's they seem to be an indication more of how you see yourself than anything yeah, which yeah. if you're mm-hmm. honest even as adults changes day to day some days i feel really great about myself and some days not so much so it makes sense that those are a little more fungible what's also very cool is that one of the advancements uh at least one of the advancements i think it's one per playbook uh has lock a label at least two what at least two okay because your your moment of truth locks a label i think oh, oh. Yeah, that's true. The moment of truth locks the labels. You actually, I think you can lock three labels. Oh wow! Through the course of your character's lifetime, 
Uh, but that is as they become more of an adult and their identity becomes more sure of themselves. Like, you see, like, Spider-Man? Spider-Man changes a lot. He thinks he's dangerous. He thinks he's a freak. He thinks he's smarter than people. He thinks he's just a kid. But he always knows he's a savior. Yeah. And that's important to that character. And, like, in very, very early Spider-Man stories, like, you know, just coming out of origin sort of things, he might not know he's a savior yet. But as soon as he's been in a run for a little bit, that is the most important thing. And so locking those labels is when you are saying, no, people are telling me all this time who I am. This is who I am. So um, before we get to advancement, how about we talk about um, our specific characters a little bit and how the group cohesion uh, works. I know in a lot of different systems, you know, you've got your tank and, and healer and damage dealer and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. Uh, but masks is, is quite different from a lot of things like that. Um, and I know in, in this game, any group combo can work. Um, yeah. But how does, how do you foresee this group uh, working together with the different uh, playbooks that we chose and the, the different characters that we created from those playbooks? Maybe a better question is, you, we talked a little bit before about how the kind of par characters you pick can kind of set the tone, too. And so maybe that's almost a better discussion to have here, yeah, what too, rather tone? than are we rounded, um, mm -hmm. you know, well-rounded as a team, but what kind of game would you end up with with this group? So I think one big thing to look at is that there's a couple of playbooks that automatically shift the tone in a really big way. Mm -hmm. Um, people in some other games, like if you're talking about Monster Hearts, people say that the Chosen does that and just like is now we're playing Monster Hearts plus the Chosen and that is a different game. And Masks doesn't quite go that far. But if you have a Doomed, your story is sadder. Yeah. Period. Because Sorry. you no, that's <laughs> fine because a big part of this game I like is the, the sad sadness. stories. <laughs> um, and so if you have that, that is automatically going to be there. If you have the Beacon you automatically are going to have extra hope because that's what the beacon is about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think with our crew, we've got a couple of the very sad playbooks, uh, but knowing that because the transformed is also a very sad playbook mm -hmm. and the delinquent yeah. can often be a very sad playbook, but the characters that were built within those, I think aren't necessarily dragging it down in the same way. Uh, I think whip is like i mean first off it's played by james so mm -hmm. whip is gonna be fun uh automatically but additionally like whip has emotional connections to things and can fit and exist within the team in a really positive way and uh idealist gets into trouble but it sounds like idealist can be fun you know mm -hmm. yeah and and so I think we've actually got a relatively emotionally balanced team. Uh, something that I look at in terms of kind of team composition is whether you've chosen moves that direct you towards the team or direct you away from the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So the two moves that I took, I took uh, I am what you see. When you spend time talking with someone about your identity, you can ask them which label they want to impose on you. And I'll save you. Uh, you're willing to pay high costs, reveal your secret identity, to, or mark a condition to defend a loved one. So, I'll Save You can definitely be used with teammates if they are a loved one, uh, And but that mostly points at NPCs. That's pointing at my character's family, that's pointing at my character's significant other. Mm -hmm. But I Am What You See is talking about your identity, and some of the only people that are going to be able to talk to me about both of my identities are my teammates. And so those are people that I'm going to definitely be triggering that move with often, which keeps me tied into the team, while also having the opportunity for me to go, no, we don't have time to fight in Spectre and Sector right now. I need to go save her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of seems like our, our team, for the most part, uh, we're, we're relatively happy people i guess um and and seems to be somewhat optimistic too i mean even the doomed that we have is uh optimistic that she will you know conquer these uh this doom that's hanging over her head um mm -hmm. even though she knows that it's coming and for me i've got my my parents are probably dead 
and I got abandoned on this planet, and I have no idea if I'm ever going to see another one of my race, but, you know, I'm happy-go-lucky. I'm, I'm just happy to be here, and happy to be alive, and happy to be able to make a difference uh, with these group of friends that I came in. I think also that beyond just sort of a general sense of happiness, like, almost all of our characters have sort of a core... I mean, this is like, this is just getting back to some of what, like, Masks does, like, for every character you make, but all of our characters have sort of this core question of, like, what does it mean to be me here right now? Like, or, like, who am I? Like, the Doomed is, like, dealing with, the like, the fact that you've got these powers from this, like, this crazy energy fact company that's, like, maybe doing tests on people, and, like, what does it mean that I've got these powers that I can use to help people, but also they're killing me, and that I'm probably gonna die, and, like, I'm not gonna live to be an older person because I'm doomed. Like, um... Mishra is like a an alien. Like, what does it mean to be an alien on a on a planet and you don't have that much contact with the people uh, who look like you? Or like, uh, obviously, Tommy is like, I am a car and I used to have friends and I care about all these people, but can they still care about me the way? Like, what does it mean to be me now? Because me is sometimes a car. Or like, especially, <laughs> I think almost more than anybody else, like Iggy is sort of is 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 uh, has two sides to their person, and yeah. and like, which of those is the truer side? Uh, the only one who doesn't sort of have that sort of like core existential question about what does it mean to be them is really kind of Cordelia, but that works because the delinquent sort of is all about breaking out of molds. And also you don't know me. So back yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a piece of team composition also in terms of like having character abilities that get the job done because you could really put together a full team that doesn't have anybody who knows how to throw a punch. And yeah. if you look at actually the Protean city crew, we have one character that knows how to throw a punch. That's true. Hey. And oh. that's okay, because we also have uh, characters that know how to... Because we also have uh, the Nova, who can do some of her magic stuff. We have other characters that can kind of tussle. But, like, if we didn't have the Nova, and if we didn't have Puck's super strength, mm -hmm. then, like, we'd be a team that's like, hey we can deal with threats as long as they don't hit us really hard. <laughs> uh, but I think that we kind of cover and that. And you can do that. like Yeah, you can do that 100%. Yeah, and, and, you, but, and like, like in the, an upcoming episode and in a character that I've played in like just personal games, like mm -hmm. I've made Masks characters who have no offensive powers. Yeah. The last, well, he was offensive, yeah. just okay. not in the same way. Let's not way. talk about him because he's coming up in an episode. He's coming up? <laughs> um, no, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, and so I made a character who like has powers, but those powers are not effective at fighting crime or literally yeah. doing anything. I'm so excited. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's going to be good. Teasers. Mm -hmm. But if you made a whole, a whole team of those characters, you'd have some problems or it would just you'd be have a game. reality show. Yeah. 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 I mean, or your GM would sort of GM a different kind of game yeah. too because that's yeah. you know important part of the job of the gm too is to sort of build the game around what people are interested in playing too so mm -hmm. if that's mm -hmm. what your group comes up with then i'm just reminded of best of luck yeah i'm just reminded of the x-men character uh doug ramsey also known as cypher uh whose mutant power is languages and that <laughs> is it <laughs> and he was a core, Im really important character for, like, a long time. I'm, I, I said X-Men. I'm Actually, it's, I believe it's New Mutants, actually. Um, so don't at me. But <laughs> there's tons and tons of scenes of the, the team being together and fighting in the danger room and doing cool stuff. And Doug being like, okay, so I guess I'll be running the danger room because... <laughs> he doesn't do he doesn't do punching and it's definitely uh, a good choice uh, if you want to to have a completely cerebral character that is not a powerhouse because that can make for a very interesting story if if they happen to get into a situation that they can't handle in a particular way they have to figure out a different way out of it someday we're going to get Sokotoa in like an underground villain fighting ring. Uh oh. And it's gonna be the best. 
That's so far down. We need him to not get knocked out for more than two episodes. That'd be good. I, I feel like it would be really fun to play a game of this, though, where you are all superheroes with, like, the most mundane, like, sort of nonsense powers that are like people are like oh that's a cool thing that you can do but it's like not remotely useful (laughs) yeah and like what that feels like in a world full of people who can fly and you know create swords with their mind or you know like what is that like to be the person that's like oh you know like i can bend all of my fingers backwards like what i'm jubilee i can make fireworks (laughs) right don't don't you dare (laughs) Like, I want to spend some time exploring what is it like to be that person that's like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. special, but not that special. Isn't that kind of the plot of Mystery Men? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And masks can do that. Yeah. Like, because, and that is the thing that is great about the vagueness of the, the powers is that they can let you take the narrative where you want to go. They'll help you stay on genre, but they'll mm-hmm. they'll let you do high-powered x-men crazy super like like uh whatever world like world reality bending powers but also mystery men nice well and like your bone regeneration could really just be like oh my arm fixes itself if i yeah. fall yeah. off my bike my fingers, like it doesn't do anything cool grow. it just like here here's a behind the scenes on a character creation cast uh my initial plan for calavera was bone generation as in healing my bones and energy absorption, as in, as I get beat up and get hurt, I get more angry and more willing to fight. Hmm. And I was going to make basically like, like a kick-ass level character. Nice. Well, I know we could talk about this for hours probably, but um, I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch. So how about, yes. let's go ahead and move on to our character advancement discussion segment and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So right now we're going to talk about how characters advance, um, what that looks like, what it means for your character. Um, So we're going to start really at the beginning is how does a character level up in masks and what do you get when that happens? So when you roll a miss, you mark potential, which is basically a little experience track. Additionally, some playbooks have moves that also cause them to mark potential. Uh, When you mark for the fifth time, you get to pick an advancement from your list that is on your playbook. It is things like take a move from your playbook, take one from another playbook, someone loses influence over you, add plus one to a label, change change how some of your features work, sometimes get a feature from another playbook, uh, and the moment of truth, as well as a couple of other things, uh, including taking an adult move and retiring from the life or becoming a paragon of the city. Uh, The most important thing to remember with advancement is that it is narratively and mechanically bidirectional. So. When you take an advancement, the narrative changes because you took that advancement. And when something happens in the fiction that demands a change in your abilities, your abilities change. So as an example, let's say that Calavera has been fighting crime for a while and she's been doing great. And then she's on national TV and has her moment of truth, and she's going around without her mask on, she's kind of no longer the Janus, because her identity is now fully known by everybody across the entire country. So the secret identity is kind of blown. If at that point, someone comes out and goes like, hey, uh, Calavera, I will train you and help you to become the superhero you could be, then maybe she's now the protege, or maybe she's now uh, the legacy. If you are the beacon and you fall into a vat of chemical waste and you come out transformed and scary and powerful, you're no longer the beacon. You're the transformed. (laughs) And that change just happens. And so you lose the things from your playbook that are no longer important because now you are the transformed. But you keep the things that are still important to you. That's interesting. Every Masks character is just one vat of chemical waste away from becoming the transformed. That is very true. <laughs> Every superhero is <laughs> also one interdimensional, uh, one interdimensional trade away from being the doomed. <laughs> yeah, very true. I like that um, because of the way that the, the the moves are formed. 
Um, and that so many of the advancements are like pick up a new move or pick up a move from a different playbook or shift your labels. There isn't that, like, and this gets back to what I was going to say about um, immersion breaking is that there isn't kind of that moment where you're like, I leveled up and suddenly I have a better sword or I can cast six more spells today or like there's no like that. There isn't that like, sort of like jarring, like in the middle of the thing, suddenly I can do something totally different um, because everything in the playbook is already sort of hitting the same theme, suddenly changing the way that you, like, interact with the world a little bit and giving you a new, like, mechanical option isn't going to radically change your character, and especially because you can describe the narrative of how that plays out. Um, I mean, and even something as, I think, the most dramatic is, like, the Nova and the Doomed do get magical powers, but with the Doomed, it's because, like, so the Doom has sort of a secondary uh, progression track, yeah. of marking their doom and when they get a new doom sign it's explicitly because they've they've sort of they've touched on their doom they've touched on their corruption uh so much that they've like they've bonded or like they've drawn the doom closer to them uh and they've ramped up their powers and so it can kind of be narratively explained as a suddenly i manifest this new scary ability mm -hmm. yeah probably the power that is hardest to explain narratively is the outsider move Kirby Craft, where you oh, have yeah. a spaceship. Oh, yeah. Because anyone can choose the spaceship. You can be playing the bull and choose the <laughs> spaceship. <laughs> and then you just have to explain it narratively. And you say, like, okay, let's make a good opportunity for the bull to break into a facility that has a spaceship mm -hmm. and steal it. A lot of the moves in that way become... Things that aren't necessarily literally meant to happen in that moment, but yeah. they become plot hooks for things that are going to happen in the next adventure. But they totally can also be things that happen in that moment. Uh, yeah. The bull has in a china shop, and it kind of, uh, if you look at Cyclops, right? Uh, Cyclops frequently has gone from being whatever Cyclops is, maybe the protege, to being a Nova. And because sometimes Cyclops just becomes super duper powerful and destroys everything. But a nice intermediate step is him taking the playbook move from the bull in a china shop. When you directly engage a threat, you can cause significant collateral damage to your environment to choose an additional option even on a miss. Yeah. Because that is going, okay, it's time to up my power level. And anyone can take that and up their power level. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's also cool too because we and we talked a little bit in our D and D episode about how sometimes there are kind of prerequisites to getting the thing that you want. Yeah. Um. You know, to to get this thing that I want at level twenty, I have to make sure that I do these other things at level five, seven, nine, whatever. Right. Um. You have to plan things out strategically, and you know where you're going. You can see the whole arc from the beginning and this is the complete opposite of that because you're you're playing out the game and as it plays out you say okay i've done this thing now it makes sense that i would have this move yeah mm -hmm. and so it's it, you can't plan it out at all and so i look at the concept of you know james and i both having filled out things on our character sheet for the doomed um, and we have totally different characters and what that would look like in you know after leveling up, quote unquote, like five or six times, we would be even further apart. Yeah. Something that is very interesting in a sort of like meta um, mechanical way is if you think about your typical like class, like D20 system class progression, you sort of start with like you've got one way to do things like you as a wizard, you don't really have a whole lot of um, you have like one or two spells early on. So like, that's the way you do things. You do those one or two things. And as you level up, maybe you pick up a, a feat that gives you a weapons proficiency, or you, you unlock more spells for your spell book. So as you move on and advance as a character, you get more options for how you do things. But in masks, because in that sort of like meta way we were talking about, you your your stats are very fluid early on. So like you may start with low danger, but a couple minutes into the session, you may have adults constantly telling you that, telling you that you're the most dangerous person there. So your danger will get super high, and all of a sudden it makes the most sense for you to be this brawly type character. Mm -hmm. um, and as you level up, as you're taking your moment of truth, as you're taking the advancements that lock your labels, you are locked. Like I think we 
we, we determined because you can do your um, there's always one advancement that locks a label and two moments, two moments of, moment truth. of truth. So you yeah. can lock three of your five labels so that by the end, like as you're getting a high level character, you're planting a flag and saying, no, this is the way my character does things. Yeah. And you're becoming more rigid and 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 like more focused in the way you do things. And you're going to have fewer options because if you lock your danger at zero because you're saying, no, my character is not dangerous. This is not the thing that's important to them. Then then that's just never changing it from that point on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people think of locking a label as being like, this is where I'm going to lock my plus three, but it can just as well be your minus two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not dangerous. I'm, I am Cypher. I am not dangerous. <laughs> minus two. <laughs> yeah, it would be so cool to play that late game uh, Transformed who locks their freak at negative two and says, no, I'm not freaky. I'm not yeah. weird. Everyone's mm -hmm. weird. I'm normal. Like, this is just the way people are <laughs> and accepts that. You've gotten used to me by now. Yeah. And then one of the advancements is being an adult and retiring your character and becoming a paragon of the city. Mm -hmm. In short-term play, that doesn't really tie in in an enormous way. But, like, for, for us specifically in our podcast, if someone chooses that, then they are a paragon of the city. They are on the same level as every other adult hero that we see. And that means that they're going to act like an adult hero which means they're going to be short-sighted at times and they're going to have, be really rigid and they're not going to be able to change who they are because they are who they are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to be able to, like, trounce you guys in terms of, like, training <laughs> and skill. Like, do not fight Centurion one-on-one. -on -one. No. <laughs> nope. Right, like, that's just, that's just not an option. And if frequency hits is sixth in advance and chooses that one, then that means that he is the psychic, uh, he is techno the master. psychic techno guy, and no one can beat him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would it be beneficial to have character advancement in mind when you're actually creating your characters in this system? I think it can be for one thing. Take a move from another playbook is in every Powered by the Apocalypse game, and it's a very cool thing, but at the table, it slows things down dramatically. So I think it can be worthwhile to glance through the other playbooks and see what moves might appeal to you when you hit that point. Mm -hmm. um, like, I was just looking at the bull and I saw There When It Matters, which lets you show up to defend somebody later on. <laughs> oh, that's good. And I love that. And, like, I'm probably going to eventually take that move for my regular PC mm -hmm. that I'm starting up soon. And, like, I don't know when I'm going to take it. But when it's dramatically appropriate and I hit the right level, <laughs> I'm going to take it. Yeah, and I was looking at the, uh, at the out Outsider playbook, and one of the advancements is choose two abilities from another playbook. And yeah. it, it's like, well, I could easily dramatically increase my power, or I could wait and do something that's going to be super narrative uh, towards the character. Mm -hmm. And it might not even be anything that's you know super advanced or anything like that, just... You know, this is just what my race experiences when we grow up. We get yeah. new things. Bone generation. Yeah, bone generation. There you <laughs> go. Yeah, I'm gonna say no. I like I for that for that reason in particular, like because so many of the moves are so narratively fluid, they give you that room. Like it yeah, I think it makes sense to wait and sort of see what happens in the game and and not plan out your character. Like just play to find out what happens. Yeah, definitely. The happy medium with that is like I, I was facing that uh, advancement that Brandon was talking about, um, you know, choosing another move from another playbook. So I came in with a list of a bunch of different moves from different playbooks that I thought, okay, if this happens to, to my character, this could be applicable. Okay, if this other thing, maybe these two are applicable. So I had like a list of eight of them and a couple of notes on each one saying, what is the catalyst for this choice? Um, to make the playing at the table go faster, but to also not make that decision too early. Another thing to keep in mind is that fa is that bi-directional thing is that you don't, you can retire from the life at any point. Just yeah. if you choose retire from the life as an advancement, you've paid for it. And so the GM uh, at that point should probably give you a little bit of a break and let that character maybe live the life that you set up for them. Let the player give the epilogue instead of the GM. But like, there is nothing wrong, depending upon how your team plays and how your table plays, 
with someone getting really angry and leaving the team mm-hmm. or getting really angry and becoming a villain. Cool. And that would, ch- they can't continue playing as a PC probably, but maybe they can for a little while. Maybe we can have them living in their new life for a session and mm-hmm. see if it goes somewhere or see if this is permanent. And if it's permanent, <laughs> then we're probably not having them as a PC anymore. And e- either way that you go, it it's pretty much all player agency based. It's what the player kind of wants. It's not the GM forcing things on the player unless, you know, it's it's disrupting play for everybody else. Yeah, you could be a like you could be a legacy that falls into a pit of chemical acid and comes out the transformed and say, "You know what? But being transformed, being scary looking is not the most important part of my story. The most important part of my story is the legacy." Mm-hmm. And then not change in playbooks. Yeah, exactly. All right. So with all of that, thank you all for joining us for our Masks character creation discussion episode. Uh, We would like to remind our listeners where they can find everybody and what everybody's up to. Um, Let's start with you, Elspeth. You can find me on Twitter at the cat on the wall. You can also find me on our Discord, um, which I'm sure James will give you the link for. And uh, I run our Instagram page at Protein City Comics. Wonderful. All right. And James? I'm James, and you can find me on Twitter at and the Meltdowns, um, or the Discord, which is at discord.stopbackandroll.com or tinyurl.com slash shrdiscord. Um, I'm also on the Stop Back and Roll podcast and Protein City podcast. And Brandon? Hi, I'm Brandon, and James left all of the Twitters to me. Uh, so <laughs> I am personally at Dr. Captain Cobalt. Uh, we also have our two Twitter accounts at Stop Hack and Roll and at Protean City. But uh, I additionally am making the game uh, Pasión de las Pasiones, which is available in Ashcan format through Magpie Games or on Drive Through RPG. So check that out too. It's telenovelas powered by the apocalypse. Woo woo. It's pretty exciting. I really want to dive into that one at some point too. We'll have to have you back to come <laughs> play through oh, yeah. that one. It's a lot of fun, I have to say. I've been really enjoying it. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a delight. Thank you for having us. Yeah. It's been great. Thank you so much, guys. It was so much fun. Mm-hmm. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Character Creation Cast is a production of the Block Party Podcast Network and can be found at www.blockpartypodcastnetwork.com slash character creation cast. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, our guests, some of our character sheets, and other shows on the network. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix, by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us, under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. That's the better question. It's like, what are we doing? How did I get here, you guys? I'm just guessing that I sound okay. You do. Yeah, we, you do. You, 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 you sound right, fantastic. Aw.
You yeah, sound but I thinner. Can't <laughs> oh my god. Thank you. <laughs> oh my god. I told Tanner right. that when he edits me, I was like, can you just make me sound a little bit thinner? That would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Bye. Appreciate it. Right. That's definitely Let's doable. Stuff done. Shut up, James. <laughs> Denim. Den- Den- I'm Den- sorry, Man. Denman. Mm-hmm. Denman? Wonderful. Denman, yeah. I'll try that Like, again. man who lives in Den. Wonderful. <laughs> That's my superhero. <laughs> den man. That's actually my family history. We lived in a den. I'm not ah, kidding. Well, there you go. Like a den, like a like a family room kind like of a den. Lean, no, like a nice lean study. to against a rock on a mountain for years. <laughs> they moved into someone's mansion in their den. <laughs> we we have lots of books in a fireplace. It's really cute. <laughs> Great. I will try that again. Elspeth Denman. I'm sorry. It's fun Den- that you Den- can say the first name and not the last name. Because that's <laughs> usually the first name. So yeah, nailing it. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh my God, that's my cat. You can hear trying to break <laughs> into the door. They're very needy. Um, so I hang out with cats. Um, Who knows what this game is about? Oof, not me. I got nothing. <laughs> Editor James cut all of this. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Good thing editor James is not editing this episode. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> Please don't make Brendan Conway hate me. Uh, um, <laughs> that'll be in my outtake. You could get by with one d six if you were really good. You really yeah, could. If if you took the ability super fast rolling, just remember, <laughs> just re- roll the die and remember what it said, and then roll it again. Just well, then you gotta 2D6. add those up. Well, I suppose you gotta add them up either way, though. If you need an additional D6 in order to play masks, I will I will give you a D6 at a convention. <laughs> We're going to start a charity. It's D6s for the children. Yeah. It's <laughs> Just important. hand out dice to to children in need. We'll in have a television live special. Yes. Yes. There it is, Brandon. <laughs> it's our <Perfect>. telethon. <laughs> so having kind of... Oh my gosh, Pippin has to be drinking from his water thing right now. Um... <laughs> Pippin. Cut that. That doesn't make any sense. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. It also has a lot of stuff that... God, I keep screwing up what I'm saying. It's Wednesday. This happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I can go... Does it, if you know, Let me know if I'm talking too much. Um, but no, I can go through them it. if people want. <laughs> we like hearing you talk, Brandon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My sultry tones. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working. It's it's Catching fine. Up. All right. Do you take a pause between the uh, talk there and making the actual characters, or no? Um, we yeah, we take a little bit of pause to put in a little transition. Okay, because I would love to throw some sweet potatoes in the oven. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. not a metaphor. If you, <laughs> okay, if you really He's actually making yeah. dinner, yes, please. yeah. I mean, what you do no. in your own time, I guess, but. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I'll, go. I'll, I'll be do right it. back. Okay. Do, 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 do. No, this is no... Come on. Go get your peanut butter. There you go. This is my good boy. Oh, I didn't mute my mic when I left. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that. He is a good boy. Just have oh, them sing something. Yeah. Oh, okay. fine. Have plans or whatever. <laughs> I guess I sing the Protean City music every Wednesday morning before we listen to Protean City, just to irritate Mark. Like on our way to work, I'll just start singing it until he puts it on. Brandon and I, we are prepping to record our show. Usually, sing our intro music for Stop Back and Roll. <laughs> yes, um, when we're getting ready to do the to do our yeah, introduction, we always. How's the sweet potato situation? It's uh, under control? S- sweet potatoes are washed and in the oven. I forgot to preheat the oven, which is okay. It'll heat up with the preheating, and that should be fine. It might extend it by like five, seven minutes. But uh, other than that, it should be good. Uh, you, you don't lose a lot of quality in the skin by doing that, so I'm okay with it. And after this, we will discuss your sweet potato recipe. Yes, please. I'm really uh-huh. excited for that really for that segment of the show. Yeah, sure. I, yeah. I, I, I want to hear what topping to go in there. Are you going to be doing mashed or what's going on? We've got a very nice chili that we're using. Ooh. Oh, all right. <laughs> this Not podcast has gone. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> Editor James, can you fix that? <laughs> James, fix all of this. Make, make it, it sound better. like we made characters. Yep. <laughs> make it make us sound cool so other people want us on their podcast. I think, think we're cooler than we are. I think everybody said enough syllables. Where we need a few more Q's, a few more Z's. Yeah. Q Q Q Qua Qua. <laughs> <laughs> it's like twenty four minutes of audio, <laughs> and you can make anyone say anything. Moist, moist. <laughs> Also, really great for an audio medium. Yep. Yeah, for nodding and I did jazz hands before too, and no one's gonna know. Well, you, really you, well. you you sound perfect now though, so you might be able to yeah. turn your video. Oh back yeah, on. yeah. Editor James, well. make it sound like she's doing jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that you have that effect on hand somewhere. Put right? little jazz fanfare in there. It'll be good to go. Let's see if this if ruins everything or not. No, nope, still nope. sounds good. Nope. All right, great. welcome back. Hey. So- <laughs> Yeah, so I made a uh, a car. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> the person with uh, the car mask. I didn't know that we had to all make cars, you guys. <laughs> oh, did I not you mention the teenage cars? <laughs> Darn it. Bird heroes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, game face. I'm sorry. I had, a, I, I had a second that I lost my playbook. <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> Gotta pull up the folder that says Protean Car Comics. <laughs> Brodian City Car Show. <laughs> um, he uh, is car. Hmm. Sorry, I sneezed. Oh, I thought you were. La- I thought you were <laughs> laughing at him being a dishwasher. No. <laughs> um. Meow. Now we get a cat. Now you hear him. Yep. I knew yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind if I take literally two minutes to go? You know what? Actually, I'm going to give it another five minutes because I let it heat up on its own. Never mind. <laughs> Let's get right here. All right. So I'm kind of excited about mine uh, because I am going to attempt to recreate. Oh crap! The the oven is going is making an alarm, <laughs> like because I set an alarm over there in addition <laughs> to my phone. Give me just a second. Feel free. Yeah, go for it. I've got plenty of time. Yeah, we've got yeah. plenty of time and plenty of stuff that we can cut out. Yep. To... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, only the things that I specified, I believe. <laughs> so okay. not not running to the the oven for the sweet potatoes. I did not specify that. No, not. that is staying in. Then I apologize. Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say, does that guy have a name? That traffic guy that hates uh, us. I didn't yes. name him, but he will be named Officer. Um... Officer Krupke. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, God, what's a good name that isn't stolen from West Side Story? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hang on one second. Here, we can name him after my fifth grade dare officer. Yes. His name, um, now I just forgot <laughs> his name. Oh, no, <laughs> that won't work. It was, no, it's a really good name, too. Hmm. A, w- a web of bones. <laughs> oh, you sit on a web of bones. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so now you can't release this uh, until Elf uh, season, which is uh, December. Uh, oh, okay. Or- <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. hold off uh, for eight more months. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise no one will catch that twisted, completely ruined reference. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that in the outtakes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Editor James. Yes. Oh, we haven't said that yet. You guys have been recording for like a half hour. <laughs> that means we're doing well, but it's all going to go downhill from here. Uh-oh. Oh, I jinxed no. everybody. Sorry. <laughs> That's We played No Thank You Evil at one point with my kids, and I asked my son, what weapon do you want? And he goes, um, just regular punching. <laughs> Great. Regular punching. Just regular punching. Okay. Do you have a family history of bone generation? <laughs> <laughs> Here are the 12 ways your powers are going to like freak out and hurt other people around you. Yeah. I'm fun. sorry you're the Nova. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Pippin, you need to calm down. I know I'm recording and it's very sad. <laughs> Idealist has powers that allow her to... Pippin, calm down. Oh my gosh. <sighs> I love him. Me too, but he, he very much wants my attention right now. We just got him a fidget spinner toy, and he loves it, and he wants me to play with it with him. Wait, there's what for dogs? Yes, it doesn't actually they don't spin. Have thumbs. Yeah, he holds it. He holds like one of the prong thing, like one of the sticking out things in his mouth, and it kind of like swings back and forth. Oh wow, that's so yeah. good. 
<laughs> um, okay. Sorry. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> also, I think we... Worth noting also... <clears throat> yep. Noted. Editor James. <laughs> and Protean City and Radio. And at Protean City. And at Protean City... Is it Protean City Radio? Is that the one? There, I'm trying to remember. There is yeah, another so. one that you created... I believe there's a secret the, one. There's a secret one. Yeah. It is uh, Protean City. Oh, PC. <laughs> <laughs> it is PC yeah. Public Radio. PC Public Radio. That's what it is. That's that's the defunct old uh, Protean City Radio Station Twitter. It doesn't get used anymore by anything. Definitely don't look at it. No, 100% don't. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for these episodes. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh-oh. Up, oh, did, did I lose? lose him? And I think he. But you know what? He's oh, thanking in. us. You're back. And it's probably. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Ann. There you are. Am I gone? Well, thank you guys. You we lost you guys for a little again. while. No wonder everybody's so quiet. <laughs> 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 yeah, and go check out Party City Comics. <laughs> Perfect. Um, that's a wrap.